Hey, what's up? Shikata Ganai back again, and we're doing another uh, video in the series for Intel Bytes. And this is a series that focuses more on Threat Intel sort of things and open source intelligence, that sort of thing. And I'm going to try to keep them smaller bite size, as the name implies. <laughs> as in the past, I didn't do that. I uh, did very long episodes. So I'm going to try to keep it more condensed and nuggets, if you will, of some Intel. So, um, some of the things I'm going to go over here, well, specifically this one today, kind of relates to my job, my daily job as a, as a cyber threat intel specialist that helps me in my own workflow. And I thought I would share it with you guys as well uh, to help you with other, with uh, your workflow if, if, you, if you need it. So in this particular case, what I'm trying to solve or my goal in this particular case here is that I want to go ahead and determine from a list of domains that I've already gathered. So I'm I'm doing kind of an external attack surface management type of, you know, homegrown type of situation. And I've already gone through and done all the open source intelligence to find all top level domains and all subdomains I can find for a particular company. And what I want to do is I want to take a list of these TLDs and, and subdomains and I want to verify and see if any of them actually have a web page or a URL of any type. Um, and that way I can kind of narrow down which ones are just bot domains that are just kind of there and uh, possibly for use or possibly to uh, combat some different um, type of squat and those sort of things. Or if they're actually real content that I need to be aware of and I need to be monitoring for my external attack service. And I really don't want to do them one at a time by going and browsing to each one <laughs> specifically. So I've created a script here that allows me to go ahead and connect to it. I'm using Python in this case here, using the request module. And it's going to go ahead and try to connect to the domains that are in my list. And they're all uh, separated by a new line, um, individual domains, which we haven't created yet, but we'll do it here in this and it's gonna go down through each one of them. It's gonna to try to connect through to them using HTTP first, and then it's gonna you know, hopefully get to HTTPS if it does a redirect, for instance. And I'm gonna tell it to follow all the redirects. And the reason for that is I don't want it to just give me back information saying, yeah, we reached out to the site and uh, it's a 403. If it has like maybe, you know, three or four redirects before it gets to the actual final result, that's the one I'm more interested in because again, I'm not really uh, entirely focused on the redirect URLs themselves. I want to actually get to where the actual web content is. That way I can set up kind of web scans and see if there's any kind of weaknesses in the website and all that kind of stuff, right? So in this particular case, I am interested in seeing all redirects and then have it print out the final URL that it actually reaches. Okay, that's the goal here. And that way I can have a list that I can now curate down and say, okay, I need to focus on these domains because they actually have these URLs. And usually with an external attack service management program, most domains will actually have URLs that are tied to it as well so that you can be aware, okay, these are ones I need to focus on. So let's get into uh, what we're doing here. So I've got this web page exist or rev2. This is my GitHub and I'll put these links in the... Uh, YouTube into in the video uh, description but I've got this Intel bytes section here and I've got this rev2 for web page exists because I made a, another one that was previous to this but I kind of like this one a little bit better the uh, output so again what our goal is again is to create a script that has a list of domains from a text file attempts to connect one to each one of them now I'm also going to throw in add in a user agent for a Chrome browser because I've found out that without doing something like that, some of these command line versions like request or something like that will reach a page and the page will say uh, browser not supported or something to that effect. And so it won't give me really any good details about the site. So in this case, I'm trying to make make each web page look, uh, make it appear as if I am coming from a Chrome browser in this case. So I will be using a user agent for that. If the connection that I do connect to does actually have a redirect, then follow all of them, print out all of the actual redirect URLs themselves, and then if the uh, connection is successful, then print the final URL to the screen itself. Now, if that final URL does have a 403 
HTTP response code that I wanted to just print out there that it has a 403 and then tell me what the actual final URL is after it. Because again, it may be something I'm looking for to see if we have an HTTP site that actually redirects to an HTTPS automatically. I, I want to know that. If it doesn't, I need to look into finding why this is a HTTP only site, right? Um, I've also set a limit on it that if it can't connect after about 10 seconds of trying, to just end it, st uh, stop trying to connect, connect to it, and then just omit it from the results altogether and move on to the next domain that's on the list. So let's break down kind of what we're doing here with this script. So the first thing we're gonna start doing is import some different things. Now, because we wanna do the connections, the HTTP type of uh, connections, we're gonna use the requests library, which is very popular for Python. And um, I'll also include some links here for this particular library documentation, such as this one here, talks about the request library. So it's always good to know kind of what it is and not just take my word for it and say, yeah, this, just, just go with it and say, you know, understand that it does this. Although I do kind of have, have a high level, what does this script do? But it doesn't go into super detail, but we'll, we'll, we'll go over some of that right now. But what it's going to do is it's going to import the necessary libraries, which would be requests for the HTTP request. Then it's going to do a URL parse so that I can go ahead and actually parse it as a URL. And then sys so that we can add command line arguments. What that means would be if my script is named websitechecker.py, if I just ran Python 3 websitechecker.py by itself, nothing else, it doesn't know where to pull the list from unless I've coded it in there. In this particular case, I'm not going to code in the name of the text file that has the domains. So I do want to supply it as an argument, which would be the actual next section after Python 3 website checker py name of text file, right? So to do something like that, I need to use the sys library for this particular one here. So we got uh, import requests from URL lib parse. We're gonna import the URL parse part of it here. We don't need the whole library, just this one that we're doing here. And then we're gonna import sys. Def would indicate a function, and I'm gonna kind of approach this that you may kind of know Python, but may not. So I'm just gonna kind of explain what I know of it. Now, keep in mind, I'm not a excellent programmer by any means, uh, but I know enough to kind of read through and understand some of the things here. But def is what they would basically call like a function. So if you're familiar with program languages, that's what it is. So our function in this case is going to be the check domain because we want to check and see if we can connect to it. In this case here, the arguments being supplied are going to be domain and user agent. Okay. And then here we got our colon. Of course, with Python, it does an indent. It's very important to have the indents. So here I'm setting up a variable called URL. This F, by the way, if you're curious about that, it's called an F string. And it's typically used for formatting purposes. It, like if you were going ahead and doing uh, a string, uh, a text string uh, that, that's going to be in the program, but in certain parts of the text string, you want to ins insert a digit or you want to insert a, another string or a different variable. Sometimes you'll see like percent %D or percent %S or something like that. So when you're doing those insertions into there, this one here is kind of the way that most people do it that I've seen is by using these particular things called F strings and it's for formatting essentially. So formatted string literals. And you typically would just put the F, well not typically, you do. <laughs> you may put the letter F before the actual string that you do want formatted. So in this case, we're putting it before this particular string, which is in quotations, telling you kind of it, it's a string. In this case here, we're saying HTTPS and domain, and we're using this as a placeholder, okay? Because later on, down here, we're gonna start seeing some of the domain start popping in, okay? So that's the that's kind of the um, placeholder. It's gonna say, whatever value I pull from the text file, domain, insert it here. So um, in this particular case, let's, let's say it's chucknorris.com is one of my domains for my list. It's gonna read HTTPS colon slash slash chucknorris.com. And then for headers, we're going to do user agent colon user agent. And this is because the one of the uh, requests dot get this one here actually takes that format for a user agent. So it's a header. They actually have a field for it in this library or header, and it takes it in this format where it's a key value. So here's the key. Here's the value. So I'm basically just uh, 
making that variable ahead of time. Okay, and I'm calling it headers. This right here is called a try except, and basically saying do this, and if there's an error that throws, print out whatever the error is for the except. So in this particular case, we're making another variable called response. And so now anytime you see response dot anything, it's basically talking about this. So all of this is essentially what's here. So we're saying the requests dot get. So let's go take a look here at this and uh, let's take a look. We'll do requests dot get and let's see what we have here. So we have quite a few different ones. Let's take a look at this one here. So they're using R instead of the word response. That's fine. Requests.get, you can see the, uh, the format of it is in parentheses here. And then they have a domain, or in this case, uh, this domain here is being replaced with our word domain, as it were. And you can put some other values here. So one of the values that we were talking about when I did my, uh, when I said my goals, is I wanted to follow all redirects. So you'll notice here, let's go ahead and say follow. Or so, no, I'm sorry, it's called allow, I think. Allow redirects, I think it's called. Or maybe it's, maybe it's underscore, <laughs> underscore redirects. There we go. So you can see right here, you can add that to this request.get field. And we're going to say true in this case instead of false. So let's go back and look again. So again, we have URL, which in this case would be this value. And then headers equals headers. In this case, headers is actually some you know, function or parameter, if you will, with the request.get, and we're telling it to pull this. Now, if we didn't have this already pre-created, we would actually put this here. And then we're saying allow redirects equals true. And we're also setting the timeout of 10 seconds in this case here, because we wanted to not keep trying to connect when uh, 10 seconds passes. Then from there, it's gonna go on to a redirect chain and it's gonna print those out. If means if this is true, do this. If not, or else, <laughs> do this, right? That sort of if, if else format. Len stands for length. In this case here, we're saying if the length of the response.history is greater than zero. So let's take a look here at response.history. So we can see here that by default, request will perform location redirection for all verbs of the head. We can use the history pr property of the response to track redirections, which is exactly what we want to do. Okay, so in this particular case, that's what we're pulling from. So we're saying if it's greater than zero, in other words, if there is something there um, as far as redirects that have that have been found, then say or print to the screen redirects for, and then whatever the domain is that we had supplied uh, as a value from our text file. And then this for is called a loop, where it's going to go ahead and try to loop through the response history in case there's more than one, uh, because sometimes it may say redirect to this URL and then redirect to this one and then redirect to this one. And here's our final one. So in that particular case, if that is the case, you want to kind of loop through those and then print all the URLs out onto the screen. So our hope is that if it does try to connect to a domain, it does actually find a connection and it does a redirect print it to the screen. And if it does another one, print that to the screen. And if it does a third one, print that to the screen. And then after all that is done, when we actually arrive at our destination that has content, and then we want to say whatever the final URL, our URL is, is the response.url, which is the final destination that we have. Um, I also want to check for 403s. That's just something I threw in there as well, because in this case, I may want to make a dashboard specifically for all the domains that actually do have redirects, uh, that'd be interesting to know. So in this particular case, if the actual uh, response.status code, which is a yet another one in the response library, and that refers to what they call an HTTP status code, and it looks like that is not on this particular page. So let's just look for it directly. So again, when you do an HTTP response, that it's a response code. 200 OK means I've made it to the page successfully. 403 means either forbidden or something to that effect. And then uh, 302 or 304 or something like that is redirect, those sort of things. So I wanted to print those out because, again, if we're doing redirects, but the final URL is actually forbidden, I do want to know that. 
If it's not, well, just print it out anyways. But because we're saying if it is, then do that. And then at the end, we're just going to wrap up our try uh, block of code here and say, and use this generic request dot exception exceptions dot request exception. And again, I'll have that listed here. Now, um, where's that? There it is. So in this particular one here, you can see the generic request dot exceptions dot request exception. Okay. And we're basically just saying if all of this other stuff here doesn't work, in other words, if I haven't connected to anything, I then go ahead and just print this saying couldn't connect. Sorry. And again, passing in the value that is the domain. And then here's our main function that we have, def main, meaning another function. And uh, so this one here is doing another if else. This case here is saying if the length of the sysargv is not equal to two. So that exclamation point equal means not equal to. And what they mean by that is if you go over and look here under the sys one, you'll notice something interesting here that the length function is used to count the number of arguments passed to the command line. Since the iteration starts with zero, it also counts the name of the program as one argument. So in this case, the name of my script, right, zero, <laughs> and then one, and then two. That's kind of how they do it with the what they call a uh, iteration starting at zero. So if we go back here and look, and we're saying if it does not equal two, in other words, having the script and having the actual file that I want, in this case being the domains.txt, that means they did not know that they had to supply a text file, in this case here. So print out a little helper text saying, hey, this is what you need to do. You need to do Python, the name of the script, and an input file. <laughs> so that's basically just a helper to say, hey. In this case here, we're going to now go ahead and uh, take in that domain list uh, as a file, we're going to open it and read it. So in this case here, we're saying input file sys.argv1. In this case here, the one, don't forget we're doing a zero one. So we're saying in the one position, this is where we want to actually go ahead and have that uh, text file so it reads it in. So they're saying whatever's in position number one, and again, if we're starting with zero, that would be the second piece, which would be our script and then that file saying pull in that particular file, and then I'm also making a user agent variable so I can not have to type all this in again. I can just type in the word user agent for when I wanna connect with that. So here we see another try accept. So this one here, it's very common by the way to do try accepts. Um, it's a good way to uh, try to do exceptions and such within your programs. This one here is interesting with open. Now, if I just did open by itself, it can work, right? But in this particular case, if you go look here uh, about the with keyword, the key thing about why we want to use this is because it will automatically release the files once the usage is complete because you don't want your program to open something, but then when it's complete, just keep it open in memory. We wanna go ahead and make sure it handles releasing a file from memory once the actual usage is done, with, which is what the with one does automatically. So it's a good one to use. We're going to use that particular one there. All right, so let's go back here. So we're saying with open, whatever the input file is, in other words, whatever this domain is that you put here, as R, which would mean read. Okay, I'm doing it as a read. As file, we're just giving it an arbitrary name. This can be any name you want because it'll be used in a for loop in the next piece. So then we're saying the domains variable is line.strip or line in file if line dot strip. In this case here, what we're doing is we're going down through each word that's in there that's been separated by a new line, and we're making sure that we strip, do a line strip, if you will, for each of those, so it's not taking the whole text file as one single input. It's actually going down through the list of each, each individual one itself and putting them in a loop. In this case, we're saying for domain in domains, which is what we've created up here, so we're saying this, the results of this, start looping through each one of those, check the domain, and then add, add the actual user agent to it. In other words, run this function, which is what we did up here, right? Which is the domain and user agent as the uh, argument. So it's saying for domain and domains, do this function here, essentially. 
and then print at a blank line between the domain results. That way it's not all clumped together in the results one right after the other. We kind of want separation and know that these are two separate uh, outputs. In this particular case, if there was no file actually found, then we want to do an exception. You know, we want to plan for that if somebody just done maybe mistyped the name of the file or whatever. The input file is not found, exit. <laughs> then this last piece here, if name equals main, I'm going to put in this uh, Stack Overflow one because I, I like this person's explanation of it here. Um, essentially, whenever the Python interpreter is going to take a file that you create, a, a .py file, source code file, it's going to start reading. It's going to do a couple things. One is it's going to go ahead and, and set a few different special variables. In this case, the uh, two underscores name, two underscore. And then it will execute the code that's found in the file. So you can read through this because it's a pretty long answer. But essentially what they're trying to say is that I want, in case somebody takes my, my Python file and tries to import it into their own script, their own script may also have a main or may also have a conflict with the, the name, and if, you will, if you will. And so by importing mine without this kind of guardrail, I guess is a good way to put it, it will kind of mess up that program that they're importing in. So to make it kind of containerized, if that's a word, to this one specific script here, we're adding in that actual name where it says the main right here. So it's hard code string to the name variable. We're putting it, we're, we're basically making it so it's tied to this script here. I don't know how else to explain it uh, better, but I'll leave a link to that one because it goes into some detail. All right, so anyways, that is what the script does. So now let's get down to the nitty gritty and start actually making it and test it out. So first thing we're gonna do here is I made a folder for this. I'm gonna go ahead and say nano and I'll call it website. Oops. Website dash checker dot py. And I'm gonna go ahead and copy the script over here. And by the way, if you haven't already imported requests, uh, we wanna do that. And we'll do that here in a second when we do our, um, we'll, do a vir uh, we'll do a virtual environment. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste that into here, okay? Go ahead and control X, Y, enter. And I'm also gonna make a domain list. So I am gonna just make up stuff. <laughs> so I'll just say, I don't know. Chuck, I don't even know if these exist. I think they do. Uh, I like Pepsi. Let's say pepsi.com. Whoops. Um, I wonder if there's a Leroy Jenkins. I wanna see if there is. <laughs> LeroyJenkins.com. Apple.com, Microsoft.com, sure, we'll add the, a few of those ones in there. That's good, that's good for now. Okay, I'm gonna put those in by line by line. Next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the feature of Python 3 to add a virtual environment. The reason we like to do that is when you're importing stuff using pip, uh, which is the way that you would typically import um, libraries and, and modules and stuff into your program. There's times where older and newer versions will conflict. So if you have an older version, or actually if you have a newer version on your machine and you try to import and the script is calling for a specific older version, you may have some conflicts. So it's a good idea to make its own separate environment that is clean and separated from everything else. It's kind of like a sandbox, if you will, for Python. So the way you would do that is you would say Python or Python 3, tac M, and then you would say VENV. And I have a, a link in my, in my uh, web page, GitHub, a, that it kind of explains these as well. I think it's under general cheat sheet maybe. I think, and I can put the link in there if you need it, right here. So I have a link describing kind of what this is and how to do it. Okay, so just in case you're curious. So you'd say VENV and then you give it a name. In this case, I'll just call it um, web check VENV. Okay, that's what I'm gonna call it. Hit enter, it's gonna create it. And what it's actually gonna do is make an entire Python environment here, right? So if we kind of look inside of there, 
uh, web check venv. You can see it's got a whole slew of different whatever it needs to run this Python code. It's already built into it. That's what's awesome about. It. So what you would then do is you notice the bin file that's in there. Is we're going to go to that and we're going to activate this uh, environment. So we're going to say uh, source. Oops. I'm having a hard time typing today. Source and then whatever I called it. In this case, it was called web check venv and then slash bin slash activate. And what it will do is give you a new prompt. And when you're done with this, if you want to get back to a regular prompt, you would do deactivate in this case, instead of activate. So what we have now is we have a completely separated Python environment to be able to do this particular script and import stuff. So we're going to go ahead and say pip3, tack r, install. Actually, not r. We're not doing requirements file. We're saying install. And we're going to do request because it's not here by default. Okay, so we're going to add that in there. If there was conflicts, again, it wouldn't be with this case because it's its own separate environment. This should work without importing anything else. So if, it, if we need to, we can do that. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and run it. We're going to say Python 3, and then we call it website checker.py. And again, we have to supply as an argument in this position the name of our file. Okay, get that. And let's take a look and see what we got here. All right, excellent. All right, so it looks like we had the final URL for chucknorris.com is this with no redirects. All right, so if you were to go here and uh, just go to chucknorris.com, it shouldn't follow any redirects, and it should directly just go to chucknorris.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't do push-ups. You don't push... Oh, what is, it? what is it? I'm trying to think of a good joke. Uh, giraffes exist because Chuck Norris uppercutted a horse. <laughs> All right. And then here we can see that there, are, there is some redirects for Pepsi.com. Again, all it's doing is taking the domain name itself. It's not adding in the www. So in that case, it's going to find that it is a redirect for www.pepsi.com. Now, I don't know why it would be forbidden. So let's uh, see what's going on here. So we'll go ahead and try to uh, navigate to it. Either... It doesn't exist, or they have a different page for Pepsi. Maybe it's called PepsiCo.com or something. I don't know. Let's see what happens. Okay, navigates, access denied. Okay, interesting. So let's see here. I bet you they have a new, is it PepsiCo.com? Ah, there we go. That's what it is. So I guess we can put that in. <laughs> PepsiCo.com is one of our domains. And uh, so that's your new site. So again, I guess they're just not allowing anything else. Anyways, go back here. Leroy Jenkins looks like, oh, there is an actual Leroy Jenkins. That's cool. Well, it, it responds. We don't know if there's any content. Let's see if there's any content here. <laughs> Leroy Jenkins. Yeah, official website. Leroy Jenkins Evangelist. Interesting. I don't even know what that is. Reverend Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> that's not the one I'm thinking. All right, Apple, looks like we can navigate to www. So in other words, it takes our domain. It doesn't do it just by itself. It slaps on a www, and uh, there it is. And it's not forbidden, so we're good. Same thing for Microsoft. It doesn't do just this. It does a dub, dub, dub. So therefore, this is an easy way for me to check. So if I were monitoring these particular domains here for my EASM that I'm creating, I now have a good idea of what the actual URLs are for these particular ones and what the final URL with actual content is and also if there's any 403s. So this one kind of like covered all of them, all the, all the goals that we were trying to do except for not being able to connect. So um, trying to think of a site that doesn't exist. <laughs> we can add that in. It should give an exception or actually it should omit it because I actually told it to not, uh, to not have it there. So, or if there is a connection. So in this case here, I think we're pretty good to go on that. Yeah. So that is my little website checker. And it's able for, uh, I'm able to go ahead and parse through these. Now, again, you can also get more advanced and just output this to CSV. That means bringing in a CSV writer with Python, that sort of thing, or Bash or whatever you want to use. But in this case, it's just very simple form of just 
running it, checking it, saying, hmm, okay, well, that's an actual site. That's an actual site. These ones are not. So in this particular case, hope you guys enjoyed it. That is my little Intel bites for today. Until next time, peace out. Thank <laughs> you.